The Long Island Sound is a tidal estuary of the Atlantic Ocean. Estuaries are partially enclosed bodies of brackish water that have rivers flowing into them and a free connection to the open sea. The Sound stretches above Long Island and below southern Connecticut and is 21 miles at its widest point. It's a living, breathing playground for a variety of marine life. To get an up-close look at this marine life, we needed to go diving below the surface and see what we could find. So let's go drop the anchor and jump in as we learn about what lives and grows in the Long Island Sound in this episode of Off the Trail. Captain Dennis Habza is an experienced diver and founder of Squalus Marine Divers. He believes that exploration is in everyone's DNA, and he's been filming all of his dives for the past four years. The videos allow him to take divers and non-divers along for the ride. And that is what we hope to do today as we explore the depths of the Long Island Sound. There's times where we'll go in the water and sometimes we'll find shipwrecks and sometimes we'll, you know, come across marine life, uh, you know, reefs, things like that. But it's really good to show people that there's something down there kind of worth protecting. So over the uh, last 11 years, what sort of changes have you seen in the sound? Um, well, when I first started, it wasn't that great. Uh, a, a, there's been a, a lot, the visibility has improved a little bit, enough to notice. Uh, there's areas like some days, a good or bad day for visibility would be six to eight feet, and now we're closer to about five to ten. So it's not inc incredible, but I'll take whatever I can get when it comes to visibility. Where would we go to go see our, our the maximum number of, of wildlife out here? You, my suggestion is right now we have a beautiful sunny day. We're going to have a lot of good ambient light if we stay in the, you know, 10 to 15 foot range and as long as we have structure, fish like structure, they like to be able to hide, they like to be able to duck in and out of things and a lot of the marine life want to stay where the plant life is because they feed off of that and then they bring in the other fish. So it's again like a food chain and uh, I think as long as we have something with structure and we're in that what I call the Goldilocks zone of you know good, good quality life in the sound where you get ambient light and good penetration with the light I think we'll be all right. So we're here in the town of North Hempstead and uh, the, uh, the local residents are really trying to work hard to reduce the amount of fertilizers that they put on the lawns and things like that, which that nitrogen eventually makes its way out into the bays here. Have you noticed a, a decrease at all out in the marine area, uh, a, a decrease at all in the amount of nitrogen and, and algal blooms out here? I haven't seen an awful lot of algae, uh, you know, Again, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert, uh, but there's some, there's some years where it was really, it, it almost, it was not pleasant. There's a, a, and a tremendous amount of fish with the whales and the humpbacks and things like that in the Menhaden and, uh, you know, the, uh, the false albacore. Something's going in the right direction for these fish to come back in mass. As long as they keep filtering this stuff out and we can kind of limit what we're putting in the water, I think we'll be on the right track. The sound is an estuary, so it's not like, like the ocean where it just, you know, the tide comes in, the tide comes out. It's always turbulent and it's, we get in, off of Connecticut shores, we get a lot of runoff from states north of us coming out of the Connecticut River, the Housatonic, and that all kind of ends up in the sound. And, and on, you know, if we were a shoreline, it wouldn't be as bad, but because it's an estuary and it kind of goes east and west and the currents change every six hours and there's an eight to seven foot tide, it's a lot of water moving around. And that's another issue with the visibility is it's very turbulent and it never really settles down. I wanted to test the salinity here and uh, I tested it before we left uh, the harbor and now I want to test it now that we're out here. So this is just a simple little test. This little bit of plastic in here floats. Um, it's a specific density and it tells us our specific gravity. And so right now it's at, uh, it's at about 27 parts per million. So, um, so that's telling me it's very salty. This is uh, full on ocean water out here. Drop off and um, do a little fancy test and 
When you guys drop in, just give me the okay. Let me know you're all right. Three, two, one. Go tie into the bottom of the boat, and then we'll swim on the surface to the rocks, and then descend. While diving in the murky waters, it was difficult to identify many of the fish before they darted away. By far, the most common fish we saw were the silver sides. But not far behind them were the striped bass, blackfish, and porgies. Amongst the many species of algae scattered about the seafloor were hundreds of mussel shells and the occasional horseshoe crab, starfish, or sea robin. Occasionally, we got a very special visitor, such as a squid, and as you saw in episode three, even the rare beluga whale. Woo! Good? We're up. Love it. <sighs> there was one point where I came down and I touched the bottom and didn't see it. And that's that's like a like a really startling, you know, sensation. It is, it is. when you're like, poof, you feel yourself laying on the ground, but you're like, I can't see the what, ground. What am I touching? <laughs> I saw some small horseshoe crabs, and there was a there was a, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of wildlife in here. Uh, it's it's very very murky, as as you're aware of Woo! after doing yeah. that dive. So and I and we've also had some days where it was very turbulent, but this is this is part of diving in the Long Island Sound. It's every day is different. And it, it really is determined based on the weather and the substrate. Here we had an extremely, extremely soft muddy bottom. So I, I wanted to tell you a couple of things I found in there was, um, uh, as long as, as far as man-made objects go, right. was a crab trap. And there, okay. was, there was a couple of crabs in it, but I saw the line extending up. So I assumed it was somebody's uh, crab pot. Right. And then after surfacing, there's no buoy. Yeah. So it was actually a lost crab pot. I should have checked it a little better. They, um, we could have rescued those crabs out of there. Yeah, uh, they, they call them ghost traps. Ghost traps. They just yeah, get they loose just, and they just keep going. And they just keep catching yep. and catching. So that was terrible. And the other thing I found, believe it or not, was this iPhone. And uh, <laughs> check this thing out. the code? <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> I don't think it's working anymore. Yeah, you can see it looks like the, the battery inside. I don't know if it's lithium, but it looks like it looks like it exploded. Yeah, yeah, because they, they, they're. They don't get along well with the water. No, and in the case uh, is salt water still. especially. Yeah, the case looks like it might still be good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but things like this would even leach out chemicals yeah. and stuff into the water, so that's not a good thing. Right. Well, I, I think our um, our dive today, I mean, it was very murky. Mm -hmm. our, our, our distance that we could see was just very short, but uh, very interesting finds underwater. During the dive, we saw firsthand the pitfalls of nitrogen pollution that created the low visibility we experienced underwater today. In previous episodes, we've discussed ways that the town has tried to combat this issue. Now, they have a new initiative that properly disposes of the monofilament fishing line that poses a serious threat to our marine wildlife. And so one of the things we wanna make sure is that there aren't plastic bags you know, in the water, and you brought up something that has been a great concern for us, um, and that's fishing lines in the water. And so we have a wonderful initiative, and it was actually started by the gentleman standing right next to me, Mal Nathan, um, and it's a receptacle for the monofilament fishing line that fishermen use. And you know, up until this point, a lot of it would wind up in the water, a lot of it would wind up here on town dock. Um, so not only were fish getting entwined in it and wildlife and birds, but you'd have people walking here and kind of stepping on hooks. As a biologist out and about, I have, I have freed, I can't even tell you how many animals from monofilament lines. And uh, it's, a real, it's a real problem that I see out there. Uh, it's something that I had seen while I was vacationing in Florida. Everywhere there's a fishing opportunity, there's a receptacle. And I thought to myself, why not bring this home with me? Uh, this is an example of what we collected uh, just over the first year. You have to see this. This is, this is just one line. year. This is one year. Could you imagine? Wow. And this all would have been in the water. It would have been on the dock. And the best part of this Tremendous. is 
the fact that we're collecting it, and we're not collecting it just because it's lots of pretty colors, we're actually collecting it. It's going to be sent to Berkeley um, Fishing, it's a company, and they're going to be repurposing it. So it'll be used to make either fish habitats or to be used to make other products. We're so proud because the EPA actually has recognized us with their 2016 Environmental Champion Award, which is citing us for protecting the environment um, and uh, protecting our water. So you can see there's an economic way of, do, it's, everything doesn't have to be a huge project that costs a lot of money. So this is a, a kind of a homegrown project that has had a tremendous effect. So if you'd like to find out more information about any of the topics we covered today, you can visit me at yc2n.com and watch full episodes of Off the Trail on mynhtv.com. So until next time, I'll see you out there off the trail.